Welcome back to AP Chemistry. In this video, we're continuing our discussion from last time where we're going to take a look at how chemical reactions can happen in two or more steps. Now, in this particular reaction that we're going to look at, we can see that uh, there are two steps involved. And usually when we have one of these reaction mechanisms, we're often asked to write the equation for the overall reaction. This is not too difficult. All we have to do is take these two steps and add them together. So when we do that, we notice that there is an oxygen atom that's produced in this first step up here, and then it's used up in the second step right here. So we can actually cancel these out, just like we'd cancel things out uh, in algebra whenever we're doing something like that. So now we just have to add these together. And when we do that, we notice that there are two N2O's on the left side, uh, two N2's on the right side, and an O2, and so it's going to look like this. And so that's the overall chemical reaction here. Now, sometimes we're also asked to identify the reaction intermediate. Now the intermediate is that a molecule or that uh, uh, atom sometimes that is produced in an early step, and then it's used up in a later step. So hopefully we can see that the reaction intermediate is this monatomic oxygen gas here, that gaseous atomic oxygen. So that's the intermediate. Anything that's used, uh, that's produced in the first step or an early step and used up later on in the reaction. So that's our intermediate. Now it would be nice if we could take this reaction the mechanism and use that to determine the rate law. Now we can actually do that. Now the only way we can do that though is to know which of the two steps is the slow step. Well, let's take this same reaction mechanism and uh, add some more information to that and determine the rate law. So let's say we have this same reaction or this same reaction the mechanism rather, but this time we are actually saying that the first step is the slow step. Well now we have some information. Like I said, the slow step determines the rate of the overall reaction. It's just like if you're in a race, maybe it's, it's a, a relay race, and you're a really fast runner, and everyone else is a fast runner except for one person, maybe the last person there, and they're really slow. Well, it doesn't matter really how fast the first three people are. If your last runner in the relay is really slow, well, they're going to slow down uh, your relay and keep you from winning. And so the slow person determines uh, the rate of the overall group. Well, it's the same thing here. The slow step determines the rate of that reaction. Now, the way that we do this is we just take rate, so we write rate, and then we say equals, K, the rate constant, times the concentration of the first reactant in that mechanism times any other reactants that might be in that mechanism. And there aren't in this case. It's just N2O. So the rate law is just that right there. It's just rate equals K times the concentration of N2O. So that's not too difficult. As long as you can identify the slow step, then you can do this. Now, let's go a step further. Let's identify the bimolecular step in this reaction mechanism. Hopefully you know that the prefix bi means two. So which of these steps has two molecules reacting? Well, that would be the second step. We have one and two. So that is the bimolecular step. Now, if the question were to say, identify the unimolecular step, can you do that? Hopefully you can see that it's the first one, because there's only one molecule there that is reacting. So that is a unimolecular step. It only, that means it has one molecule basically decomposing in that step. Now, if one means unimolecular and two is a bimolecular, then three would be called termolecular. Well, as it turns out, you're not going to have termolecular steps very often. In fact, those are very rare. 
And anytime you do have a mechanism with a termolecular step, it's probably going to be very slow. And that's because a termolecular step requires three molecules. Imagine three molecules. You know, here's one, here's uh, two, and here's three. Well, these three molecules are going to have to collide in just the right orientation and energy at exactly the right moment with the right orientation for them to react. And that doesn't happen very often. It's like three billiard balls on a pool table colliding at the exact same moment. Doesn't happen very often, just like it doesn't happen in the real world and with these molecules. So termolecular steps are very rare. And I'm going to add, if you do see them, they're probably going to be fairly slow. And by the way, if there are any uh, steps that would have four or five or six molecules in there, they're very unlikely to take place. And if they do, they're going to be very, very slow as well. So let's try some more examples here. Let's try another reaction mechanism. And once again, we're being asked to write the overall equation for this. And so when we do that, we notice that we can cancel some things out. It looks like there is an NOCl2 on the right side and on the uh, left side of the second step. So we can cancel those two out. And by the way, do you remember what that's called? It's called a reaction intermediate. The intermediate is what is uh, produced in the first step or an early step and used up later. So now we can add these together. I see two NOs and a Cl2 and we produce two NOCLs. Now let's determine the rate law. Well, as we said, the rate law is determined by the slow step. So that means that we're going to say rate equals K times the first reactant, which is NOCl2 in the slow step, times the second reactant, which is NO. So that's it. Do you see a problem with this rate law, though? It looks like we have a reactant that doesn't actually appear in the overall balanced equation. You know, there is an NOCl here, and there's no, or NOCl2 rather, and there's no NOCl2 in the overall balanced equation. So someone's going to look at this rate law and say, there's something wrong with that. So that's not the rate law. We've got to do something else to this. We have to actually go back up to the step where NOCl2 was produced, which is the very first step there, and find the rate law for the production of NOCl2, and then substitute that in for NOCl2. So that rate law would be rate, and we can call it rate prime or something like that if you want to, equals K or K prime if you want to call, that, call it that, times NO, the first reactant times the second reactant, which is Cl2. And now all we have to do is take the NO and the Cl2 and plug this into NOCl2 down here. So this is kind of uh, messy, so let me just make that a little neater there. So now we can put all this together, and of course this NO is going to combine with that NO to make it NO squared. And so it's going to look like this. And so here is the actual rate law for the reaction. Rate equals the rate constant times NO squared times chlorine, Cl2. So this is a slightly different, or I guess more difficult uh, problem, where you have to write a rate law from the mechanism. Now let's try another example. Let's say we have this uh, reaction. So using this mechanism, let's write the overall reaction or the overall equation for the reaction. And once again, as we always do, we need to look at what can be canceled out. So when we add these together, I notice that there is uh, an IO negative on both sides. So I can cancel those out. I also notice that there is an I negative. We have an iodide ion on both sides. So I can cancel those out as well. And 
Now I think I can add this up. So we have two hydrogen peroxides yield two water molecules and an oxygen molecule. So there's part A. Now uh, identify, that should say identify the reaction intermediate, not the mechanism. The whole thing is the mechanism. The reaction intermediate is what's produced in the first step and used up in the second step. So that would be I O negative. That is the reaction intermediate. So that would be I O negative. Now, part C says identify the catalyst. Now, the catalyst is kind of the opposite. A catalyst is something that is present at the beginning and it's also present at the end. And so as a, as a result, it's not consumed in the course of the reaction. Now notice that it does participate. You know, the, the, the catalyst is iodide here. It does participate. It does uh, get used or, or it's part of that reaction intermediate, but it's kind of a spit out at the end here. So iodide ends up being the catalyst. Now, the last part of this says the rate law. Well, if we take a look at the slow step once again, it would just be rate equals K times the first reactant in the slow step, which is H2O2, times the second reactant in the slow step, which is iodide, I negative. However, if we take a look at that rate law, we see another problem. You know, the I negative, the iodide, is not in the overall balanced equation. So someone's going to look at this and say, well, hang on, there's something wrong with this. So we know that catalysts can't be in the rate law. Now, fortunately, fortunately, there's a very easy way to take care of this. We just basically omit the I negative. So the, the rate law is just that right there. So it's the same as it was before, except we just omit the catalyst because it's not, uh, it's not actually going to be in the rate law. So that's all you have to do for that. Let's try another example. We have two steps, a generic mechanism here, and it says write the overall equation for the reaction. Well, once again, we want to cancel out what's present on both sides. I see an AB right here and on the left side of the second step, so that's the reaction intermediate, so I can cancel those out. I have a B molecule uh, starting out and ending up here, so I'm going to cancel those out. And now I can add everything up, so it's A plus B plus C yields ABC. Now part B asks an interesting question. Which of those two steps would you expect to occur at a faster rate? Now this is an interesting question. We're not told which one is the slow step, which one is the fast step. We have to uh, use some of our chemical knowledge here. Well, w we might notice that the first step has two molecules reacting, A and B. So this is what we would call a bimolecular step. Whereas step two has three things that are reacting with each other. We would call that a termolecular step. And we said earlier that termolecular steps are actually rather rare. And when they do occur, they're very slow. So I would guess that step two would be the slow step and step one would be the fast step. And as we can see, that does seem to be the answer. Why is step one faster? Because it is a bimolecular step. Termolecular steps like we see in step two are very rare and slow because they require those three molecules to collide in the correct orientation and sufficient energy. So just think of those three billiard balls on the pool table that would have to hit at just the right way. That doesn't really happen very often. So the step two is, 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 is the slow step there. Let's take a look at one last example. Here we have the slow steps from two different chemical reactions. Which of these two processes will have a faster rate and explain? Well, once again, we see that both of them are bimolecular, so that doesn't really help us. But we are given the rate constants. And we can figure this out just by looking at the size of the rate constant. The larger the rate constant, the faster 
the reaction. So reaction two here, we have a, a rate constant that's much larger than it is in reaction one. So since reaction two has a rate constant with a larger number or a larger magnitude, then it's going to be the one that's faster. So this is just a, a quick lesson about reaction mechanisms. I hope you learned some chemistry here that will get you ready for the AP exam or for your uh, uh, chemistry class or whatever you're doing in chemistry. If this is a review, then hope this has been a good re review for you. Uh, I make lots of chemistry videos, both for AP and first year chemistry. So if you learned something on here, uh, I hope you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss a thing. I uh, hope you give me a thumbs up, and I hope to see you once again on my uh, YouTube channel here. Uh, my name is Jeremy Krug, and I hope we can keep learning chemistry together.